God is so good. I'm excited to be here. And that was amazing. Thank you, worship team. Um, all right, well, usually I'm in children's land, and today I'm in adult land. I love being with the kids, and so actually, Pastor Joe is here today, but he's in children's church land, and so he's out there hanging out with the kids. He might be coming in a little bit later, but uh, he's alive. It's Resurrection Sunday again for him. <laughs> he was pretty beat up this last week, and I call him up just about every day saying, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm not feeling good. And, uh, but he's back, and so I am uh, glad to have him. He did, ha unfortunately, have to miss the uh, missions trip down to San Felipe, and so the team went without him, so he was kind of bummed out, but uh, God is still good, and they're having a great time down there, and, um, and so kind of we both had weeks of disappointment. I was supposed to be running in the Boston Marathon on Monday, and uh, that didn't happen because I hurt my calf, and, uh, but it's okay because it was bad weather again. And so I am just trying to get there on a, on a Monday morning where it's not bad weather. In 2015, it was the worst weather in 30 years. I went back in 2018 thinking it would be better. It was even worse than 2015. <laughs> I got there in 2019 thinking, okay, this is the year. It was snow at the finish line. And I was at the start line, snow at the start line. And we start the race, and then it gets super humid and hot, and I get totally dehydrated and almost die with it. six miles to go. It was crazy. But I'm going to go back there one of these days. But the good news is Julie Wong went, and she finished the race. And I'm not sure if she's here this morning, but I was tracking her the whole way, and, uh, and she finished in four hours, 20-some-odd minutes. And so that's really, really cool. And she would have thought, if you would have asked her about doing the Boston Marathon, five years ago, it would have been completely like, no way, she's not a runner. I mean, this is like, and I was just, come on, you gotta do it, you gotta do it. So I gave her the book, I said, follow this plan, and, uh, and you're gonna do it, and you'll be okay. And uh, so she signed up, and she did it, and so it's pretty cool. So when you see her, she's probably gonna be like this. It takes about a month to recover, at least for me, to, uh, to walk downstairs, and I've got lots of stories, but that's for another day. Welcome, everyone. Good to have you. Any visitors here with us for the first time? Any brave visitors want to raise your hand? Awesome. Welcome. Good to have you here. Anybody else? Awesome. Welcome. Good to have you here. I can't believe just two weeks ago it was Easter, and uh, I don't know, I heard it was a lot of people in here, but we had like the great problem of too many kids in children's church, and I'm like, yes, thank you, Lord. For me, it's like, Lord, I pray that we would run out of crafts today. I pray that we would run out of snacks today and sure enough we ran out and it was great and we were scrambling and there were so many kids and uh you know we we give the gospel message we tell the story of easter we we say okay you know who wants to receive jesus and all their hands went up so praise god 100 percent, they all received jesus so it's pretty cool i don't know what it was like in here but i'm sure it wasn't 100 <clears throat> percent. so you got some work to do in here all right, do I, oh, look at that, that's so pretty. Okay, I am excited, I'm gonna share with you guys. So this is our 100 year anniversary of Coast Christian Fellowship, and I don't know about you guys, but that is so cool. So we've been talking about it, we're already a quarter into our 100 year celebration, and we've got one banner up, but we have some other things planned, and uh, this is gonna be one of our uh, many kind of tributes and look backs of 100 years and what's happened in this place. Honestly, it's mind blowing. Um, I am wired where I am constantly just going forward. My eyes are forward, my body goes forward. I believe God designed us to go forward and so I don't look back very often, but I've been tasked of looking back and kind of coming up with some creative ways of how, what we could do to celebrate. And so I've been looking at our history and it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. This is not just your ordinary church, for real. I mean, there's lots of churches around. I think Journey of Faith, I went driving by them, and they've been around since 1911, so they beat us. But our history is, like, rich, and it's not a competition or anything, but I am so excited to share with you guys because um, this is our church family. Like, this is our church, and maybe you just got here last week, but if this is your home church, like, you get to grab hold 
of the legacy and the heritage and then the inheritance, inheritance uh, that this place has. And um, you're going to be blown away. I hope you are blown away. Um, I've got my summer face on. I was in the sun for seven hours yesterday <laughs> at a track meet at South High. Maybe you heard my voice on the announcer. And uh, I just got to brag a little bit. There's my daughter in the front row. She's our two-mile champion, Pioneer League. So good job, Chloe. I saw Jesse's out here. Jesse, raise your hand. Come on, senior Jesse over there. Jesse OJ, he's one of my sprinters. He's so fast. He is so fast and such a big guy. So he qualified in the 200 meters and the 100 meters. And, uh, and so he also runs on our relay team. And as I was worship, worshiping this morning, I was thinking, you know, I love talking about track. I love talking about running and things like that. And I'm in, part of my message is about this race that we're running. And the Lord reminded me that it's not just a race. It's a relay race. We are in a relay race. We are grabbing the baton from those that were before us, and we're continuing on on this glorious mission that the Lord has called us to. And so I love teaching and coaching the relay, you know, when you see it happen beautifully, it is awesome. Guy comes in smoking hot, the person behind him has got to leave just at the right time, and there's this beautiful sinking up where basically the baton, speed of the baton doesn't slow down. So Lord, I pray this morning that each one of us would grab the baton of those that ran before us, extending all the way back, not just 100 years, but all the way to the day that Jesus rose from the dead, because it's awesome. I've titled my message today, um, I, what am I titling it? I'm now sending you. And so we talked a few weeks ago, it was Easter morning, and we talked about Resurrection Sunday. But do you realize what happened on Resurrection night, on the night? Jesus, he appeared. Let's just take a look real quick. It says that that evening, the disciples gathered together, and because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jewish leaders, that had locked, they had locked the doors to that place where they met, all right? The disciples, they were, they, were, they were scared. But suddenly, Jesus appeared among them and said, peace to you. And funny, when you look up this word, according to Brian Simmons, that word peace to you, always think, okay, that's kind of a weird thing, peace to you. But basically, the modern day translation of peace to you is just, hello there. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. Hello there. I mean, we're thinking like, peace to you. Like, we don't say that today. But back then, it was just, hello there. And here's Jesus showing up to the disciples behind locked doors. They're freaked out, right? And he's like, hello there. I love that. I think that was so fun when I read that. Hello there. Then he showed them the wounds on his hands and his side. They were overjoyed to see the Lord with their own eyes. Jesus repeated this, his greeting, hello there, peace to you. And he told them, just as the Father has sent me, I'm now sending you. Then taking a deep breath, he blew on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Come on. I mean, we, I mean, Easter is a great day. I, I say it's the Super Bowl for all Christians, right? And we celebrate, yes, he's alive, he's out of the tomb. But we don't tell this part of the story very often, do we? Come on. Hello there. Now as the Father send me, guess what? I'm sending you. Whew. Receive the Holy Spirit. He doesn't waste time at all, does he? He doesn't waste any time. I am sending you just as the Father sent me. So that's our passage for today. So here we are, Coast Christian Fellowship, 1923. I'm going to give you the super short version because actually a part of our sermon is going to be taught by someone else, all right? And hopefully it all works out on the AV side. Thanks, by the way, AV team. So real quickly, guys, Coast Christian Fellowship, 123, 100 years, established in 1923. Um, I'm getting my things all mixed up. Here we go. I should put my glasses on. Full Gospel Assembly of Inglewood. Um, when I look at the histor historical records, it was a guy named Pastor Kaylee Stambaugh who was there in 1920, and he served from 1920 to 1928. And I was actually able to find the Articles of Incorporation from 1923, Pastor Joe. It's pretty cool. And, uh, and so during that time frame, that's when, uh, and then from there it went on to become Calvary Assembly of God in Inglewood. All, by the way, this all started 
100 years ago in Inglewood. Okay, in 1947, a guy named Robert Bauman and Reverend, uh, the, the senior pastor of that church, William Roberts, they launched Far East Broadcasting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Far East Broadcasting today. The other thing that we're really, this church is really noted for is that in 1956, Lauren Roberts, he's the founder of YWAM, while he was working at Calvary Islam, he was working for the church, he was working in the youth department, he was working uh, in the worship department, he led the choir, okay? He uh, had this crazy vision of a map that became alive with waves of young people crashing all over the world, okay? And so we'll talk later on about why when, but it's amazing, all right? So he gets this vision of the Lord, right, from the Lord, and then in 1960, that's when uh, YWAM was launched, okay, a few years later. Incredible, and that's gonna be another time. Just as a plug, next Sunday, we have a special guest. Dan Bauman's gonna be here, and so he, uh, he's been here several times. He is um, an awesome missionary speaker with YWAM. He's gone all over the world, has the most incredible stories of him being in an, uh, a prison in Iran for preaching the gospel, and so I wanna encourage you to come and invite your friends to that. It's gonna be really, really good. Uh, but he's been with YWAM. YWAM is the largest uh, mission organization sending in the whole world, okay? The reach is just incredible. And so you can go to their website and read about it, and Dan will st tell stories next week. But I'm not gonna talk about YWAM today. I'm gonna talk about Far East Broadcasting. Okay, just real quickly, fast forward. In 1973, so 50 years ago, we bought this building for guess how much? This whole land, 1.9 acres. $270,000, woo! That's a pretty good price. You know how much it's worth now? Add a couple zeros, all right? <laughs> it's a worth a lot of money. But God is good. You know what? They built, I, I saw this video on this place. That side used to be a restaurant. It was open for five years in the 60s, the 50s and 60s, but they finally closed it down because guess what? It was just too big and not practical for a restaurant. But God had something in mind, right? He wanted to bring a church here, so he brought Coast here. So they moved from Inglewood to Torrance in 1973, and uh, the senior pastor, then you kind of fast forward, the senior pastor at 1973 was William, William Wilbur Wacker. Um, they changed the name to Calvary Church of Torrance, and then that was kind of the official name, and then they changed it even more to Calvary Church of the Coastlands, and that's when they also, in that time free period in the 70s is when they started uh, Coast Christian Schools, Coast Christian Schools. And so Pastor Wacker at the time had a huge heart for Christian education. Have any, any alumni from Coast Christian Schools here? Yay! Two, that's so cool. And so they had a high school, they had a middle school, they had a, the whole gamut. I mean, it was big, they had multiple campuses. And when I got here in 2006, it was still going on, and I was still part of that team, and they had celebrated their 30-year anniversary. And so Coast Christian Schools still exists today, but it, now it's called Valor. Valor Academy, Valor Christian Academy, right? And so it's there in Redondo Beach on Earl Lane. And so Pastor Wacker had a huge heart for Christian education, and it just exploded. It was awesome. And then, once again, this is the, the short version, in 2003, Calvary Church of the Coastlands and Torrance Christian Fellowship, led up by Guy Takashima, they merged. This congregation had dwindled down pretty far, and some of you guys were here. I see the he knows we were here, right, during that time frame. And anybody else during that time frame? From, anybody here from Calvary Church of the Coastlands this morning? You were here? And the Medinas are here. Medinas are here in the back. Yes, they were here. And and um, Eladio was on the board, and that was a, that's a whole other story for another time. And but they came together, they merged, and it, and they changed the name to Coast Christian Fellowship. So that's um, what's happened. Guy Takashima served from 2000, really, as the um, Torrance Christian Fellowship, all the way to 2017, and then Pastor Joe Gill. That's when he became senior leader in 2017. So he's coming up on a six year anniversary, so that's pretty cool. So very, very neat. Let me show you a picture. That's the brief history, that's the super brief history. Here's the picture of the 1920, right there in Inglewood, of the Pentecostal mission. So, so cool. Here's a picture of that senior uh, leader. I had Pastor Elton Hill. I don't know where he fits quite into this whole thing, but I've heard his name, so I just put it up there. But from what I saw, the guy, this man right here is Kaylee Stambaugh. He was the senior guy, and then he passed it on to Louis Weston. And then this is from 1923. We still have it upstairs. This is the 
uh, they became incorporated, and you can see September 4th, 1923 on that little thing. It's pretty neat. And so in September, we're going to have a big old celebration, and we don't even know what it's going to look like. But it's going to be big, and it's going to be fun, and there's going to be food, all right? <clears throat> Here's some other fun stuff that I found. So in the 1930s, here's a poster advertising what they're going to be doing at the church that night. And so 1934, they had actually moved into a new building. And here it is, Revival News. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Things are happening, folks. Come get the honey. <laughs> 1934, let's go. I say we make a shirt of that and we put it on. What do you got? Who would buy that shirt? Buzz, buzz, buzz. <laughs> Things are happening, folks. Come get the honey. Come get the honey. Come get the honey. Oh, my gosh. So listen, revival is part of our heritage. Celebrating 100 years of revival. Come on. And the 20s was all about revival. That's another day. Here's another picture on the right. Here we go. The gospel news. Man looketh at our appearance, but the Lord looketh at the heart. Full Gospel Assembly of Inglewood. They're right there in 500 Sentinella Avenue, Pastor Louis Weston. What else have we got? This is in 1934. They moved to a new location. There was a little article in the paper announcing that, and they had invited all these important people. And then in 1937, I found this is their corporate records. Uh, this is when they actually merged with another church. So it was the Hyde. Let's see if I can read it. The Full Gospel Assembly of Inglewood. And this congregation adopted the new name of Calvary Full Gospel Assembly of Inglewood. It was the Calvary Church of Hyde Park. So it was two mergers. So it's interesting. Also in our DNA, in our heritage, is the bringing together of congregations, the forming together of congregation. Hey, Peter's here. He was part of that board too. So that's awesome. You've been here a while. So there's the corporate record with more mergers happening in 1937. But the significance of that date is that this new senior pastor, William, William Roberts, he's down here at the very bottom right, he became the senior pastor. And I'm realizing that this guy was a champion. OMG. So he was the senior pastor, and the assistant during that time frame was Robert Bauman. Okay, Robert Bauman, Bob Bauman. Here's some pictures of the different, this is the, the building over here, so there, so there's kind of some of the pictures. The plan is to actually hang some of these old pictures up in the hallway and hang it up around so you guys can take better looks at it. They're really, really fun to look at, okay? So anyway, these two really team up, these Bob Bauman and this Pastor Roberts, they were really a dynamic duo, and their whole thing was they wrote hymns, and they did radio stuff, okay? And they hired a radio station over in Hollywood, and they got really, really good. So basically, here you have the worship leader and the senior pastor partnering up, and they began to just have this passion to take the gospel in song, take the gospel and broadcast it, first here just in LA. But it became so popular that it grew, that the, the reception was so awesome that God planted a vision to, to expand it even more, okay? So here they are. There's some of the brochures, taking the radio, okay? It says, Gospel and Song Hymn Book. Gospel Song was a radio broadcast produced under the auspices of Calvary Assembly, Church of Inglewood. That's us, all right? Remember, that's us of California. As director of music of the church, Robert Bauman played a major role in the production of the broadcast and wrote several hymns in this booklet. See, whatever, okay? I got this all from the Far East Broadcasting Archives. Here's a cool picture. I'm, I was thinking that me, Eric, Dan, <laughs> that we should maybe have a shot because in 100 years, they're going to be talking about us, right? We don't have very good pictures, so we're going to take a picture like this maybe for next week. I've got a globe in Children's Church that we're going to use. <clears throat> Pretty funny, huh? There's this other guy here. I don't know his story very much but he was also an integral part of the Far East Broadcasting. Here's, I found this in the archives, that they actually came up, they wrote basically their whole mission statement and what they were gonna do and laid it all out. And it was incredible, like, oh my, their vision and the planning that went into this was like mind-blowing what they wanted to do. Okay, is the audio almost queued up? So check this out. Here's their very first broadcast. Let me see if it works. Guess how many 
much it cost me to produce? $2,000. <laughs> but that was a lot of money at the time, all right? And so they go through, there's song, there's narration, they tell a story. It is so, so good. I wish we could listen to the whole thing, but there's just not enough time. I'm gonna keep going, okay? So anyway, here's, I know, I know, I know, I know. You have to go to, the, you have to, go to their website. And, but I wanna play this, and this is about nine minutes long, and this is, you know, as I watched it, I, actually, I found it last night, and then I had another one I was gonna play, but this one was even better. And so this guy's gonna share the message for about nine minutes. And so this is Robert Bauman. He was around, he died in, in 2014, but this guy was a champion. And I just kept on thinking, man, this was the senior pastor and the worship leader. They, they came together. And I was thinking, oh, man, this is like Joe and Anthony, man. They came together. And what God did through them is just, just mind-blowing. Okay, here we go. When we started broadcasting to China, there were two million Christians in China. But now, after all of these years, it has grown to 90 million Christians in China. Come on! Throughout history, God has been on mission to reach the nations. He does this through people who are willing to submit their lives to Him in faith. Robert Bowman was one of these men. Christian Radio City, Manila, Philippines. It all began here at 6 p.m. on the night of June 4th, 1948, with the initial broadcast of DZAS. Ito ang Far East Broadcasting Company. Tinadala ang maputing balita ng kaligtasan. It was envisioned by John Roger, William Roberts, and myself. Dr. Bowman attended Southern California Bible School in Pasadena, currently known as Vanguard University. It was there that Bob found spiritual maturity. A remark from a teacher that struck him was, Bob, what you are to Jesus Christ is far more important than anything you will ever do for him. This statement caused him to submit his life to Christ and to whatever Christ had in store for him. In the chapel of Southern California Bible School, there was a world map. Bob saw this map in his head repeatedly as he meditated over the vast areas of land that were untouched by the gospel. Most of these areas were unreached by missionaries, and Bob thought, if radio can bring non-believers to Christ here in America, why not use it to reach people in faraway places? Here in the Philippine countryside, I want you to meet a trophy of God's grace. I did not believe in God. And uh, it came as a surprise to myself when I found that people love other people even if they do not know them. In 1945, FEBC was founded to share Jesus Christ with the people of China. It has since grown into a large network of radio stations broadcasting the message of Jesus Christ's redemption to people throughout the world, focusing mainly on Asia. Bob Bowman said, From the beginning, we were driven by two things, a passion to obey God and compassion for people who didn't know Christ. Now we knew that this was the essence of the Great Commission, and we also knew there was no turning back once we put our hearts together. We had a few ideas about how we might do it, but God had other ideas. He first showed us we couldn't do it and that he would do it himself through us. Bob Bowman never claimed to have an extravagant talent, an incredibly brilliant mind, or a spirit of self-achievement. He had a surrendered human heart that was all God needed to shape him into the man of obedience. The passion Bob had for reaching the lost was all supplied and gifted by the Lord for his own glory. Why does Far East Broadcasting Company broadcast the message of the gospel? It's because we love the people and we want them to know that God loves them too. I was overcome by the realization that 
This is what FEBC is all about. It's ministering in God's name to countless individuals for whom Christ died, who perhaps would never hear if there were no missionary radio. The worth of a single soul, in God's eyes, more valuable than the whole world. I'm writing this letter on behalf of many in my village who asked me to thank you for your broadcast. We all accept Jesus as our Savior because of your radio programs. It is the individual for whom Christ died, including men and women with heartbreaking physical needs, patients in the Central Luzon Leprosarium, lives blighted by the dread disease that so isolates them from life in a normal society. Find comfort in the daily broadcasts of FEBC Radio. One of the most important ways Bob Bowman was able to identify God leading him in his life was by the peace in his heart. If you come to the time that you're struggling with something that is very significant uh, and uh, you don't have peace about it, you just keep waiting until you have peace. And when the Lord puts peace in your heart, you can know he's talking. Bob found that peace. Radio is the spiritual lifeline to these who are so completely isolated from all other means of hearing the word. I found a new family because of your ministry. I'm not alone anymore. I'm so grateful you led me to Jesus. Bob Bowman was also extremely careful to keep preaching the gospel as FEBC's main focus. He advised, We have to be careful that we always maintain the vision that God gave and use these other things on the side as things that can be used along the way. And don't let that take your eyes off of the mark. Millions of people each year contact this organization in response to the gospel message being broadcast. Yet Bob never took credit. When we look at what God has done, I mean, it's, until you see it all on a map of the world and what's going on everywhere, you, you're blown over. Yeah. And when I look at that, I say, well, I don't know why God chose me to be one of the ones that helped to found it. The scripture says he chooses the foolish things in the world to confound the wise. Bob Bowman's life is the story of changed hearts through Christ, only to glorify God. Because of one man's faithfulness, FEBC continues to broadcast the message until the Lord returns. As Bob Bowman constantly repeated the words of William Carey, Attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God. We at FEBC are so committed to fulfill the legacy started some 70 years ago by Bob Bowen. We will never let him down. This is the joyful thing, the legacy. And I often say to people, it's your ministry, and you are the one with us that are accomplishing this. We praise God for you. And I think the legacy of FEBC is simply the millions of souls that have come to faith in Christ throughout the vast Asian area during these times. The legacy is these are the people, Lord Jesus, that we bring place before you, your kindness in bringing them to faith in yourself, having their sins forgiven, entering the, the joyous kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ.
amazing, isn't it? Oh my goodness, has anybody seen that before? That's, the, that's our church. That's incredible, absolutely incredible. And uh, when I saw that, I was just uh, blown away of just what's possible, you know? I mean, he had no clue. He was just, I believe, day by day, trusting in the Lord and taking the next step. And uh, what God has done through that ministry, and if you look at it, you can go to their website, they're all over the place, and now they're expanding beyond radio, and they're going into social media now and, and broadcasting the good news through social media, and it's incredible. So praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm gonna talk real briefly. Um, we're on a missions trip right now. Our church, we're down in San Felipe. Has anybody ever been on a missions trip before? Awesome, I wanna encourage you guys to go. Um, a lot of times what I hear is, you know, we go and often we will go into a church and we will share, we'll do programs, we'll go door to door and uh, we'll minister to, we'll travel to different churches and bring ministry and ministry teams at night and stuff like that. And every response, I always hear, man, it was so good, but what the Lord did inside of me was just more, even more mind-blowing. So I wanna do a little hypothetical real quick, and I wanna, I wanna maybe, let's just pretend for, for a moment, and I wanna pretend that each one of these sections is going to a different area of the world. So let's pretend, let's just cover the different continents. So I want you guys to go to Peru, all right? You guys are gonna be going to Peru. You guys are gonna be going to... The, the, the Georgia Republic, does that sound good? We're gonna go over by Russia, that area. Where do you guys wanna go, Val? California. No, not California, Ford. I mean, I was kinda. Of, uh, yeah, Florida. No, not Florida, somewhere. <laughs> okay, Russia. They're already going to Russia. Okay, where, where are you guys going? Mal, where do you guys wanna go? Asia. Asia. Asia, and where's this going? Cuba. We're going to Cuba. So we're just gonna pretend real quick. And so honestly, let's pretend that you got the time off of work, pay time off of work, your spouse is gonna let you go, you got everything going, or even that you get to actually like take your whole family with you. What would you be doing right now if we're gonna leave, let's say, in 30 days? What would you start doing? <laughs> start raising money. Now, there's no money. Money's taken care of. We're writing a check for everything. Now, usually that is a big concern. How am I gonna afford to do this? Let's pretend all the money's taken. What would you start doing? Building a team, you'd start coming together, you would start meeting, you'd start strategizing, you would start understanding, you would wanna understand what's going on in Cuba, you'd wanna understand what's going on in Peru, you wanna understand what's going on in Russia, right? You'd get an understanding, right? You'd get a lay of the land, correct? Now some of you guys, I would be, now most times when you go on missions trips, you, you're gonna be asked to share, right? A lot of times you're gonna be say, hey, you need to be ready with five, 10, 15 minutes to share your testimony, right? And so some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, I gotta speak in front of people? That's not good. A lot of times you go door to door. I know when Steve, when he takes teams to Africa, you know, you ask them to get ready, right? And uh, you're gonna be sent out and it's gonna be amazing. You're gonna see miracles. You're gonna see incredible things, but you know, you're gonna start, you gotta start praying and meeting and coming together as a team. There's a lot that would happen. Would you guys all agree? Right, a lot would happen. <clears throat> You would kind of understand, well, what role am I going to play? You would do research. Uh, we would try and contact the local pastors and, and kind of understand there's the issue of language, right? Well, who's going to speak? Who's going to translate? Right now, they have two, three translators down in San Felipe. And a lot of times what's, what's, um, a lot of times what's happening is you need to um, simplify your message so that it can go through a translator real easy, right? When I talk in children's ministry, I gotta be able to speak their language. And so the night before, the couple days before, I'm thinking, okay, how do I get this concept of the kingdom and speak it in their language? Well, you gotta do the same things. A lot of times when you go to the unchurched, a lot of the language that we use here in church, it just doesn't work out there. They have no idea what you're talking about, right? Jesus always spoke in parables. You gotta start thinking of the parables that the Lord has given you guys to be able to speak as well, right? So there's lots of preparation, there's lots of questions. There's a lot of prayer that would happen. 
We would do our best to understand the customs and the cultures of the day. A lot of times, you know, ladies, when you go down to South America or you go into Africa, you gotta lose the little, sh the, sh the short shorts, right? You gotta wear the long skirt because you don't wanna offend people. You don't wanna offend the, what the culture is going on, okay? And so there's a lot of preparation. And here's what I wanna kind of get to you guys real quickly. Here's the big point is, I believe that we should always carry a missionary mindset. We should always be trying to understand, like God has called us here to Los Angeles. Some of you guys wish that you were called to Texas, but the Lord has brought us here to Los Angeles, okay? And with all of its problems, with all of its traffic and with all of its, you know, uh, just crime and rising hopelessness and drug use and just the junk that's happening. I believe the Lord has called this church to be salt and light and a missions base here in Los Angeles. Like he's brought us here. I'm from, I'm from Northern California and I never wanted to be in Southern California. You guys take all of our resources, right? <laughs> yes, you have nice weather, but the traffic is horrible. You know what I mean? But I have been walking and I believe that God has just really reminded me, every time I'm kind of like, why am I here? He always says, because I've called you here. Because I've sent you here. Because I've brought you here to Los Angeles for a reason. And so I just always go back to that place. We are missionaries here in Los Angeles. And you are to carry a missionary mindset, okay? You're here to carry a missionary mindset, okay? And I believe God wants to do that in each one of us. Missionaries, they have a mission. Missionaries know the cultures and customs of Los Angeles. Missionaries have a message, right? What's your message? Missionaries speak the language of the people, okay? Talking to people. Missionaries are bold and they take risks. Missionaries love the people that they are serving. We heard it from Bauman, compassion for the people. They love the people. I used to hate going to the mall. Every once in a while I do. But I like going to the mall now. You know why? Because it's full of people. And I'm here as a missionary. And there's lots of people. Remember? We love people. Jesus loved people. So if you don't like people, you got to change your heart. <laughs> you got to like people. You got to like people. We're all about people. We're in the people business. Missionaries pray. I remember my, the last mission I went on, it was a while back, it was in 2005. I went to, I went with Pastor Doug. He, him and I served together for a couple years. And um, we went to Brownsville, Texas, and we went to a little fishing village on the other side called El Mezquital, El Mez. And it was about three hours south of Matamortos, is that right? Brownsville and Matamortos in Texas. And it was a rough mission trip. We get there, I get food poisoning right away on day one, right? And it was just rough. And, and then I still make it, I come out alive. Day two, we drive down to El Mezquital, I'm recovering, it's super hot. And, um, and then the missions leader, Doug, he gets sick. And he's saying, you're in charge. And I'm like, what? <laughs> this is before I'm on staff, I'm like, are you kidding me? Everybody thinks I know Spanish because I'm brown. I don't know Spanish, you know? <laughs> this is not good, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, okay, Lord, here we go. And so, oh, and then it's 2025, 20, the same year as Hurricane Katrina. And so before there was Hurricane Katrina, there was Hurricane Emily. And it's coming your way. And so we basically have one day to do missions work right there in El Mezcatal, this tiny fishing village about three hours south of the border. And the main guy's sick, and now I'm going door to door with a translator, kind of embarrassing, right? And talking to people about Jesus. And it was so scary, but it was so good because my heart was in a place of, God, I, I, I need you. <gasps> you were there, you remember that? Yes. And um, it was scary. And so we went out, we did like a VBS program, we played soccer, and Doug was sick, and, and he's getting better, and then all of a sudden the federalities come driving around, and they're kicking everybody out because a hurricane's on its way. And so we get in the vans, and we drive all the way up, back up to Brownsville, Texas. We stay 
in a little Baptist church and a category five hurricane is coming our way. And what do we do? We start boarding up the surrounding neighborhood of that little church getting ready for this hurricane. And I don't know if you guys have ever been through a hurricane before, but it was wild. Fortunately, that, that church right there was okay um, because it was, it was raided and built for it, but the hurricane came in. It was fine when it got to Brownsville, Texas, but the whole place was shaking, and it was uh, quite a night together. All the kids were coming out like, oh, this is so cool. They're looking outside the doors, and us leaders like, get inside, get inside, this is crazy. The next morning, we wake up, and uh, I go with, um, gosh, I'm forgetting the names, Clay and some other guys, and we actually go back to El Mezquital, and the whole fishing village is wiped out. It is crazy. Like, the roads were all gnarly. Like, the day before, all the homes that we saw, they were underneath water. All you saw was the tops, people wandering around in boats. It was a very, very bad situation. So that was my last missions trip. <laughs> But what I learned through that whole process was so good, right? Because the Lord, I was so dependent on the Lord in that whole time. Like, Lord, this is wild. This is not what we had in mind. This is obviously redirected. But the cool thing is the Lord used us to do some really cool stuff down there to minister. Um, we, I, I forgot to say this, but we actually were boarding up the church down there in El Mezquital before we got kicked out by the federalities. And it was just incredible. We had bought all this lumber and we used it to board up the church. And so it was incredible. What it did in me, it really um, changed my heart. It, like, I need to be dependent on you. Missionaries are dependent on, on the Lord every single day. And I, it was such a good heart posture for me. I think a lot of times what happens is when we do a short-term missions trip, we get all gung-ho, we get all ready, like, let's go, let's go. And then we get back home and we kind of just settle back in to that same old lifestyle. Like, well, someone else will go reach this area. Someone else go, will go reach this area. And I believe the Lord wants us to keep us in that urgency of like, like, let's go. Like, let's have the prayer meetings. Let's, let's, um, let's, let's plan. Let's strategize. Let's figure out our different roles. Let's figure out our different functions. You know what I mean? It's such a good heart posture to be in. So what if, let me go through a couple of these. What if what if we really took this beautiful city and this was our mission field right here? Like, what if we took, like, this was our mission field? Now, we're called to the South Bay. You guys see the South Bay? Look at our pretty little hill. Like, what if we really said, this is, this is our, where God has called us to? I believe that um, we can do a lot. And you saw what God can do through one person that said, Lord, take, send me, you know, Bob Bauman. But what if we all had that missionary mindset and say, God, use us. You know, a few years ago, we had this word over this church that this was gonna be an apostolic training center. And um, apostolic, that we're gonna be ones that equip and ones that release people out to go. And I believe, you know, it's not just something that, it's not nothing new, right? God has put in our DNA of this church that we are an apostolic training center. We're a church about revival and seeing um, the gospel go out and the gospel being broadcasted. And we just saw it. That's far broadcasting. That is the worship leader basically saying, yes, Lord, use me, send me, I will go. And look what he's done. Lauren Cunningham, same thing. He was the worship leader. He worked with the youth, okay? And look what's happened through YWAM. It's incredible, okay? The first century church saw this incredible explosion. Incredible explosion. Why? Why? Why did it explode so much? I believe they lived with urgency. They lived with a sense of, we gotta go 100% pedal to the metal. They didn't have the Bible back then but they sure did have Holy Spirit. And right there we see, right in John 20, 21, we read it, as the Father sent me, I also send you, and he breathed Holy Spirit on him. In Matthew 28, 18 and 19, we love talking about all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, of nations. 
Jesus empowers them, right, in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Incredible. Remember, it was Easter night that he commissioned him out. I'm alive! Yay! Now what? Go. I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out. I'm sending you out. And I believe the disciples and the followers of Jesus, they carried that so deeply within them, okay, that we gotta go. And the church began to explode. Now, was there incredible persecution? Yes. But what happened as a result of the persecution? I believe there was just even a greater dependence on the Lord that the disciples carried, like, what are we doing? What do we do, Lord? What do we do, Lord? And that actually led to even a greater expansion. Now, is there persecution arising right now in our nation against Christians? Yes. Absolutely, 100%. But you know what? Guess what's gonna happen? The same thing's gonna happen that happened to that first century church, I believe, if the church will actually do what Jesus said. Now I am sending you. Now I am sending you, Daryl. Now I am sending you, David. Now I am sending you, whoever you are out there. I'm sending you. We're sent ones. That's what ap apostle means, right? Sent, we're sent. Who are we sent by? Jesus. What's our mission? Preach the gospel to destroy the works of the enemy, right? To undo all of his lies, to bring the truth, to bring healing. Now, some of you guys, maybe that sounds like kind of a scary task. And guess what? It's just like a missions trip. That's okay. That's okay. That little pressure you feel, it's normal. But guess what? As you begin to step out and as you begin to like take risks and watch God flow through you, it becomes the most exciting adventure ever, right? Steve over here, Trillinger, he leads teams to Africa, has been doing it for many, many years, and many, many years. And his motto when he takes people overseas and they begin to see and witness miracles like crazy stuff there in Africa is that they are wrecked they come back wrecked beyond recognition. Isn't that cool? When Daryl goes, I talked to Daryl this morning before service, when he takes people to the malls, there's no doubt that they're gonna see miracles at Delamo. He's like, yeah, you're gonna, you come, you're gonna see miracles. So if you wanna see a miracle today, meet at Joanne's Fabric Store right there in Delamo at 1.30. You don't even have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. He'll just follow him around. If you don't wanna pray for this, if you're a little skeptical, does God really heal today? Just go, check it out, and you will see miracles. You're gonna see a miracle. He's like, he's completely convinced, and now he's hooked, right, Daryl? He's hooked wherever he goes. He's like, I, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And some people will say no. Some people will get a little bit of, will get rejected, right? But he doesn't let that phase him or stop him, no. He just keeps on going, because he's fully convinced. And that's such a good place to be. And as we step out, as we take risks, as we um, realize that the baton we're grabbing is not just from Bauman, it's going all the way back to the times of Jesus, to the original church, right there on Easter night. And we grab the baton when Jesus said, as the Father sent me, here is the baton, now I'm sending you. But you gotta grab the baton and go for it and run with that determination, run with that urgency, run with that passion. I'm becoming more and more convinced, and I'm getting older, I need my glasses here, even though I didn't use them, that, um, you know, it, 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 that our time on earth is limited, right? Our time on earth, and what's the saying, carpe diem? We really have to seize the day. We really have to take advantage of this time that we have right now. Don't wait, don't delay. I know we all have um, goals and ambitions and retirement and things like that, but you know, 
when we get to heaven, when we meet Bob Bauman, he's gonna meet us there. He's gonna be, how did it go? Did you watch the video? Like, you've all seen this now, right? He's gonna ask us, what did you do? What did you do to step out? And I hope it's more than just, I got a great 401k and I worked in children's church, you know? Not that that's bad, I need workers, okay? (laughs) But it's gonna be, I want it to be big. I want it to be bold. Make it be something way beyond your box. Really ambitious and go for it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for this, um, this morning. We thank you for the ministry and the legacy of, Fe- of Far East Broadcasting. And I just pray, Lord, that you would um, minister to our hearts this morning, Father, and that you would uh, just hear your heart's cry for the lost, Lord. Father, that we would hear your your. Um, your love for the lost, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would um, just speak to every soul here this morning and that we would respond to just your desire to see us jump in the race and and get the bit And so I just want to get a a response right now. I just believe the Lord just wants us to to just uh, say, yeah, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to grab the baton. I didn't plan this out. I don't even know how it's going to work, but I'm just going to go for it. If you want to jump in the race, if you want to um, grab the baton from the people before us, I want you to stand to your feet. No pressure. And uh, yeah, this is amazing. Once again, no pressure. On the way out the door this morning, I saw this clock on my counter, and I felt like, oh, that's kind of interesting, and it just popped out at me. And then I didn't bring it to church, and then I, uh, and then I called Jody and said, bring the stopwatch. I don't know why, but I just feel like I'm going to use it. I need to use it this morning. The time is ticking. Let's start the race. And I'm going to hit go. And this is going to be the start of your race. I mean, check it out. Look at all the people standing in this room right now. Look around. And, uh, and I believe that this is going to be a prophetic act of your race starting and you grabbing hold of the baton and you running as fast as you can and as hard as you can and go for it. Ready? Set? Jesus, we grab hold of the baton and we dedicate our lives to running hard after you. Father, we know that you're such a good daddy and you're going to help us and guide us each step of the way. But Lord, like short-term missionaries, I pray that you would just, we would become completely and fully reliant on you each day. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see the mission field in front of us, that you would give us eyes to see all the lost and souls around us, Lord. Father, I pray that you would empower your church today to walk in signs and wonders, to give them boldness, to put words in their mouth, Lord, and that each week we'd come back with testimonies of your faithfulness, of your love, of your power, and that you would just, that this place, Coast Christian Fellowship, would truly become a missions-based, an apostolic training center, a place where people are equipped and set to the change the world that you've called them to change. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. <laughs> Woo! Amen. Woo-hoo. Okay. Well, here we go. You're all in this race. I'm going to be asking you. I'm looking around, and just like a coach, I'm going to be asking you, this is just the first of many, many messages that we're going to be giving to talk about being sent out, being equipped, and 
and running your race and finding your mission field and getting organized and getting strategized and really taking LA for Jesus. Amen? Amen. We have a prophetic team here after service, and if you want to get a prophetic word, which I would encourage you to get, then you're going to be located on this right-hand side. We're going to spend a little bit more time in worship. If you want to go and you need to pick up your kids, that's totally cool. God bless you. Have an awesome rest of the day, and go change the world. Amen.